so over here on the left hand side this is your classical stratified squamous epithelium that we can appreciate on the left hand side okay on the right hand side if you see on the right hand side if you see this is basically your gastric epithelium this is basically your gastric epithelium okay which is basically pseudo stratified columnar epithelium it is a columnar epithelium okay and if you if and if you appreciate okay in between the two there is a type of epithelium which is columnar in nature no doubt it is columnar in nature but it is containing what is called as goblet cells yes can everyone appreciate these goblet cells over here so this is the intestinal type of columnar epithelium intestinal okay and this is the metaplastic epithelium that is the intestinalized epithelium it is the intestinalized epithelium so normally always remember the lower end of the esophagus contains the stratified squamous epithelium now constantly if there is an irritation of this lower end of the esophagus by the acid reflux then what is going to happen the particular stratified squamous epithelium is going to undergo metaplasia why because it has to protect itself so it is going to undergo what is known as intestinalization okay the epithelium starts to become columnar and also it contains goblet cells and what is the role of this goblet cell the goblet cell is going to secrete the mucus so it is going to protect the lower end from the acid reflux which is happening okay so is it very clear now the microscopic examination of the barrett's esophagus yes for everyone so can everyone appreciate the well formed glands yes everyone can appreciate that there is a gland formation over here so there is some resemblance to the gland formation which is indicative of adenocarcinoma nature now in in the middle of this gland they are producing certain mucin material so they are mucinous they are containing mucin so these are the mucin producing cells why they are mucin producing cells yes what is the importance because they have to produce the mucin so as to protect the mucosa from the acid okay and why am i saying it is a cancer you can see there is a back to back gland formation is there so a gland is present just in back of other gland and the nuclear features if you see they are highly pleomorphic hyperpromesia as their vesicular nucleus is there so they are highly pleomorphic in nature so this is the microscopic features of esophageal adenocarcinoma so good afternoon everyone is my voice audible yes sir okay so let us start today's topic of discussion <clears throat> so today as we had already discussed that today we are going to uh, read about barrett's esophagus and we are also going to understand about barrett's dysplasia followed by esophageal adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma so today's uh, topic of discussion we are going to start with the barrett's esophagus now as you understand barrett's esophagus is uh, mainly a complication of a chronic gastrointestinal reflux disease also called as GERD okay so it is a complication of gastroesophageal reflux disease now one very important uh, thing with regards to this is that that what is the barrett's esophagus it is actually it is actually characterized by metaplasia which type of metaplasia it is a intestinal metaplasia that means uh, because of the chronic gastroesophageal gastroesophageal reflux disease there is a conversion of the normal squamous epithelium in the lower esophagus into columnar epithelium and not any columnar epithelium that type of columnar epithelium which is containing goblet cells okay so th this is very much similar to the intestinal columnar epithelium that is why it is also called as intestinal metaplasia okay intestinal metaplasia so around 10% of individuals with gerd is going to develop this kind of metaplasia usually it is affecting the males around 40 to 60 years of age and these individuals have an increased risk of esophageal adenocarcinoma so although there is an increased risk of esophageal cancer the risk is for only adenocarcinoma not for squamous cell carcinoma okay so how are we saying why do we say that uh, the barrett's metaplasia is also basically you know why it is causing esophageal adenocarcinoma how we can say this we can say this we can say this because there are certain mutations which are present in the barrett's esophagus and the same mutation is also found in esophageal adenocarcinoma thereby establishing a risk uh, or link between your esophageal carcinoma and barrett's esophagus okay the risk of development of dysplasia 
okay in the barrett's esophagus is basically 0.2 to 2% per year now most individuals with barrett's esophagus they do not develop esophageal tumor now this is a very important point that we need to understand okay so what does this point tell us this point is telling us that most of the most of the uh, you know barrett's uh, metaplasia okay they will not end up developing esophageal tumor so this is a very important thing so although barrett's esophagus or barrett's metaplasia is an important risk factor for development of adenocarcinoma but most of the individuals who are having barrett's esophagus they will not develop esophageal tumors remember this that is the only reason why screening or endoscopic screening of the esophagus for barrett's is not done okay because most of the cases they do not develop uh, you know into adenocarcinoma okay so those who uh, those of you who have joined late just a basic uh, you know uh, revision for you all today we are reading about the barrett's esophagus which is basically one of the complications of of chronic acid reflux disease that is called as gerd it is characterized mainly by intestinal metaplasia wherein the normal a uh, squamous epithelium in the lower part of the esophagus is converted into a columnar epithelium which type of columnar epithelium the one which is containing goblet cell which is characteristic of intestinal uh, epithelium so it is also called as intestinal metaplasia barrett's esophagus is basically involving 10% individuals with gerd basically it occurs more in males uh, aged 40 to 60 years now barrett's esophagus or metaplasia has an increased risk of development into esophageal cancer which type adenocarcinoma and why do we say that we say that because both of them are sharing a mutation okay the same kind of mutation the risk of development of dysplasia in a barrett's esophagus is ranging from 0.2 to 2% per year and most individuals with barrett's esophagus they do not develop esophageal cancers or any other kind of tumors this is a very important point so coming to the morphology so grossly if we are going to examine the uh, you know endoscopically the esophagus involved by barrett's metaplasia they are basically red in color red velvety mucus extending upward from the gastroesophageal junction so from the lower end of the esophagus if you go up you are going to find red velvety mucosa if you can appreciate over here okay these areas in this particular image these reddish areas the red velvety areas okay these are areas of barrett's metaplasia okay very important now if you see the barrett's um, uh, you know the barrett's metaplasia is alternating with certain areas which are basically pale in color can you appreciate everyone a pale color area in between the barrett's esophagus yes so this area is the area of a normal esophageal lining okay that is a squamous epithelial lining so the metaplastic mucosa which is the barrett's uh, mucosa is alternating with the residual smooth pale squamous mucosa which is the normal esophageal mucosa in the lower part of the esophagus okay so by endoscopy okay okay barrett's esophagus can be classified into two types if the length of the barrett's esophagus is less than 3 cm we call it as the short segment barrett's esophagus if it is 3 cm or more we are basically calling it as long segment barrett's esophagus okay so this is how we are classifying the barrett's esophagus okay so this is how and by endoscopy you are looking at the barrett's esophagus always remember the red velvety area okay the red velvety mucosa as we see over here it is reflecting the barrett's esophagus it is reflective of the barrett's esophagus okay which is showing the metaplasia and the pale squamous mucosa it is the normal lining it is the normal lining of the lower third of the esophagus now <clears throat> this is the gross image okay wherein we can appreciate on the left hand side the left hand side of the image that is we are looking at the the left hand side of the image as we can appreciate it is showing the normal gastroesophageal junction so you can see there is a clear cut line of difference between the two there is a clear cut line of difference between the two that is the if you can appreciate over here clear cut line of demarcation is there so this is the normal esophageal mucosa this is the gastric mucosa okay this is a normal gastroesophageal junction now over here on the right hand side if you see it is the barrett's esophagus now the red velvety mucosa as we can appreciate yes 
This is the classical Barrett's metaplasia that we can appreciate the red velvety mucosa. In between, if you see, there are certain areas which are pale in color. Yes, these pale areas they are reflective of the normal lining of the lower end of the esophagus, which is the squamous epithelium, the residual pale island. So, grossly, this is how you should describe the uh, Barrett's esophagus. Okay. Now, very important, as I told you, the columnar cells that is replacing the squamous epithelia, okay, they are basically, they should contain the goblet cells, okay, most commonly they are of, you know, they are of intestinal type containing the goblet cells, but sometimes they might have, you know, a non goblet type of an epithelium. Okay, that is they might contain gastric type of epithelium containing the foveolar cells. Out of the two varieties, or intestinal type of metaplasia is far more common. That is the one which is containing the goblet cells. Okay. So let us look at this particular image as we can appreciate over here. So in this image, this is the microscopic image of the Barrett's esophagus. Okay. So over here on the left hand side, this is your classical stratified squamous epithelium that we can appreciate on the left hand side. Okay. On the right hand side, if you see, on the right hand side, if you see, this is basically your gastric epithelium. This is basically your gastric epithelium, okay, which is basically pseudo stratified columnar epithelium. It is a columnar epithelium, okay. And if you, if, and if you appreciate, okay, in between the two, there is a type of epithelium which is columnar in nature. No doubt it is columnar in nature. But it is containing what is called as goblet cells. Yes, can everyone appreciate these goblet cells over here? So this is the intestinal type of columnar epithelium, intestinal. Okay. And this is the metaplastic epithelium. That is the intestinalized epithelium. It is the intestinalized epithelium. So normally always remember the lower end of the esophagus contains the stratified squamous epithelium. Now constantly, if there is an irritation of this lower end of the esophagus by the acid reflux, then what is going to happen? The particular stratified squamous epithelium is going to undergo metaplasia. Why? Because it has to protect itself. So it is going to undergo what is known as intestinalization. Okay. The epithelium starts to become columnar. And also it contains goblet cells. And what is the role of this goblet cell? The goblet cell is going to secrete the mucus. So it is going to protect the lower end from the acid reflux, which is happening. Okay. So is it very clear now the microscopic examination of the Barrett's esophagus? Yes. For everyone. Okay. Now the definitive diagnosis is made by two is twofold. You have to go for an endoscopy. So endoscopic findings has to be documented. Along with the endoscopic findings, you have to carry out a biopsy at the same time and to carry out the microscopic examination as well. And you have to document this metaplasia for a diagnosis. Is it clear to everyone? Now, under the microscope, okay, uh, now what happens now till now, what we are reading about, we are reading about metaplasia. And as we understand that metaplasia is one type of an adaptation. Okay, so it is a reversible change. But metaplasia, if it continues for a long period of time, it might become irreversible and metaplasia might convert into what is called as a dysplasia. Dysplasia is nothing but it is a disordered arrangement of the cells. Now Barrett's dysplasia, it can be low grade dysplasia or it can be high grade dysplasia. Now, irrespective of the grade, whether it be low grade or high grade dysplasia, in dysplasia, the very important thing is there is an architectural disturbance with disorder arrangement of the cells and they contain atypical mitosis, nuclear hyperchromatia. The nucleus becomes hyperchromatic. There is an irregular clumped chromatin that we see, high NC ratio, failure of maturation of the cells. So the glands uh, will show crowding, budding and will show different types of shapes. Okay. So these are the features which are present in all high and low grade dysplasia. So if I am going to show you the metaplasia, so on the left hand side below, if you see, there is a classical normal intestinal metaplasia. Now look at how the polarity is maintained. All these cells over here, they are arranged. The nucleus is, is basically present at one pole. Okay. And they're arranged in a very benign fashion. But if you see over here, uh, you know, at the place this arrow has been placed, if you if you observe this area, 
So this area, what happens that the metaplasia has changed into a dysplasia. So what happened that the acid reflux continued. So the insult was there, the damage was there, and now the metaplastic epithelium becomes dysplastic. Now look at the cells, how they are arranged. So they are hyperchromatic. They are showing pseudo stratification. Okay, there's a disordered arrangement. They are not at the poles. They should be present along this lower pole, but they are present up and down. They are hyperchromatic. Okay. There are sometimes irregular clumped chromatin as we can appreciate. Okay. Now also one very important aspect over here is that these gland, this is called as a dysplasia. And usually this dysplasia is basically a low grade dysplasia. Okay. Now, whenever, whenever such kind of dysplasia, okay, such kind of dysplasia is going to form a gland within a gland appearance. So usually the glands are separated from each other. Normally the glands, okay, when they are lining, okay, they are separated from each other like this. Okay. This is what is called as separate normal glands. But over here, there is no such separation. One gland is present here. Just on back of that other gland is also present along with that other gland is also present. So this appearance is called as a cribriform appearance or gland within a gland appearance is there. Okay. Like this. So there is no clear cut demarcation between the two glands. And this type of arrangement is classical for high grade dysplasia. It is for high grade dysplasia. So I hope you have understood the basic difference between this. What is dysplasia? What is metaplasia? How you differentiate the two? what is low grade dysplasia and what is high grade dysplasia. Okay. So the only, so I'm just repeating once again. So high grade dysplasia, it is having more severe cytological and architectural changes. There is a classical gland within a gland or a cribriform appearance as we have appreciated. Okay. Any doubts anyone is having? Is it clear? Everyone? Okay. Now, if you are going to the clinical feature, so patients are usually having symptoms of acid reflux. So heartburn will be there. Okay. Uh, these basic symptoms will be there. So patients presenting with symptoms of GERD, they undergo endoscopy and biopsy. And from there, the diagnosis is being made. Okay. Now, how are you going to carry out the treatment of such patients? Okay. How, what, what is the line of treatment? So in case, okay, invasion has occurred and the patient has developed a carcinoma or it is an in-situ carcinoma, that is intramucosal carcinoma, or there is a multifocal high-grade dysplasia, not a single focus, multi, multiple focus of high-grade dysplasia is there. In such cases, you have to go for a surgical resection along with esophagectomy. Okay. But in case you are encountering low-grade dysplasia or there is a single focus of high-grade dysplasia, the treatment is you should follow up the patient with endoscopy and biopsy. For example, every three months or every six months, you will call the patient, you are going to go for an endoscopic examination and you are going to do a biopsy from that area to see whether any dysplasia has developed or no, or whether any high grade dysplasia or invasion has developed. So this is all about our Barrett's esophagus. Anyone is having any doubt with regards to the features of Barrett's esophagus? Yes, it is a very important short note, which is asked. So I think I've given all the points. Okay. You should not miss any of these points that I have discussed over here, including the endoscopic findings, gross findings, microscopic findings. Okay. Okay. Now we are going to understand about esophageal carcinoma. Now there are many different types of esophageal carcinoma that we have, that we can come across, but the two most important types of esophageal carcinoma that we see, one is our adenocarcinoma. One is our squamous cell carcinoma. So out of the two types, the most common type worldwide is your squamous cell carcinoma. It is the most common type, which is seen worldwide. That is a squamous cell carcinoma. Okay. Now another type is also that that is the uh, other major type is adenocarcinoma. This is more common in developed countries or basically in Western countries like the United States and Europe, whereas squamous cell carcinoma is more prominent worldwide. And even it is more common in India, even it is more common in India. Now, the other uh, less common types of esophageal carcinoma is the undifferentiated variety of carcinoma, carcinoid tumors, melanoma, lymphoma, and sarcoma. Now, the most common, most common esophageal tumor, okay, overall, if you see, it is the benign tumor that is leomyoma. It is the most common benign esophageal tumor. The most common esophageal cancer in world or India, as I told you, is squamous cell carcinoma, whereas increased incidence of adenocarcinoma is basically seen in Western countries as we have seen. So first today we are going to start with adenocarcinoma of the uterus, the, uh, sorry, adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. 
so uh, uh, so very importantly first we are going to discuss the risk factor so as you see the first and the most important risk factor for development of esophageal adenocarcinoma is the presence of barrett's esophagus second is what is causing barrett's esophagus that is obesity associated gerd tobacco use radiation okay it is seven times more common in males and in caucasians okay there is a group of individuals okay that is caucasians there is a race they are having an increased risk of adenocarcinoma so what are some of the factors which are decreasing the risk of esophageal carcinoma consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables are decreasing the risk of esophageal adenocarcinoma along with that also something called as the h pylori infection now you must be thinking that how h pylori infection is is decreasing the risk of esophageal adenocarcinoma because due to h pylori infection it causes gastric atrophy and when the gastric parietal cells undergo atrophy they are not being able to produce any acid so if no acid is produced then no acid reflux symptoms will be there so automatically the incidence of barrett's esophagus will come down and therefore the incidence of adenocarcinoma is also going to come down so pathogenesis much is not known about the pathogenesis but both genetic and epigenetic factors are implicated so those of you who have attended my previous lecture you must know what is epigenetic and what is genetic changes i hope okay so uh, this uh, process of development of carcinoma occurs in steps okay so first there is a development of metaplasia followed by dysplasia and then there is a frank invasive carcinoma now one very important thing is that why we are uh, you know we are uh, linking the metaplasia with adenocarcinoma because all of these are containing the same molecular alteration so what molecular alterations are there so as i told you there are always two groups of genes one is a group of gene called as a tumor suppressor gene so if there is a down regulation or decreased activity of the tumor suppressor gene like the p53 cdk and 2a then predisposes to development of esophageal carcinoma again i told you there are some groups of genes which is acting as a proto oncogene so amplification of certain proto oncogenes like egfr erbb2 cyclin d1 or cyclin e so all these uh, amplification of these genes will increase the risk of esophageal adenocarcinoma coming to the morphology of the esophageal adenocarcinoma if we are dividing the esophagus into three parts upper middle and lower part so always remember that the most common site for adenocarcinoma that we are reading it is the distal or the distal half or the lower part of the lower one third of the esophagus is the most common site for esophageal adenocarcinoma whereas the most common site of this squamous cell carcinoma is in the upper and middle part and if you have to choose then the middle part is responsible for 50% cases of squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus so always remember esophageal adenocarcinoma is more common in the lower third whereas squamous cell carcinoma is more common in the upper and the middle third out of the upper and middle third the middle third is most common site more than 50% of the squamous cell carcinoma is occurring in the middle third okay so grossly the esophageal adenocarcinoma they are begin as a very flat or raised patches to and you know and and it can grow up to a very large size more than equal to 5 cm so they can either be exophytic growth or they just like in case of the stomach they might diffusely involve the esophageal wall so diffusely they might involve or they might be presenting as an infiltrative or ulcerative lesion so diffusely it might infiltrate the wall causing the thickening or it might cause ulceration followed by perforation so these are the patterns in which the esophageal adenocarcinoma can present so this is the gross image now what is this yes this is the esophagus this is the gastric this is the gastroesophageal junction so basically this is the esophageal adenocarcinoma on the left hand side okay on the left hand side okay so this why am i showing the uh, showing you this because over here this is the lower one third of the esophagus which is the most common site for esophageal adenocarcinoma it occurs distally whereas on the right hand side if you see this is this entire thing is the esophagus okay but in the middle third you are seeing a constricting mass okay which is the most common site of squamous cell carcinoma okay so squamous cell carcinoma more than 50% occurs in the middle third whereas in the lower third esophageal adenocarcinoma occurs okay so microscopically any kind of an adenocarcinoma if you see they are going to show gland formation plus that gland is going to secrete mucus so there will be mucin formation along with that in the nearby epithelium you can appreciate barrett's dysplasia as well so this is the most common finding when you get when that that mass is growing like a exophytic polypoid mass but in some cases as i told you there might be a diffuse involvement of the entire wall 
so that wall is going to present as a thickened wall okay and especially in those cases just like in the lecture on gastrocarcinoma as i told you there was a diffuse infiltrative variety over there they were containing what is called as signet ring cells okay the cells produce mucus and the mucus pushes the nucleus to the periphery thus giving a signet ring appearance okay very similar to the diffuse gastric carcinoma this variety of esophageal carcinoma adenocarcinoma is the less common variety and lastly we can have a poorly differentiated variety which does not contain well formed glands okay so let us look at this image okay this is a hne image so can everyone appreciate the well formed glands yes everyone can appreciate that there is a gland formation over here so there is some resemblance to the gland formation which is indicative of adenocarcinoma nature now in in the middle of this gland they are producing certain mucin material so they are mucinous they are containing mucin so these are the mucin producing cells why they are mucin producing cells yes what is the importance because they have to produce the mucin so as to protect the mucosa from the acid okay and why am i saying it is a cancer you can see there is a back to back gland formation is there so a gland is present just in back of other gland and the nuclear features if you see they are highly pleomorphic hyperpromesia as their vesicular nucleus is there so they are highly pleomorphic in nature so this is the microscopic features of esophageal adenocarcinoma okay so clinically these patients they are presenting with pain and difficulty during swallowing they will have progressive weight loss hematemesis vomiting and even chest pain so the five year survival depends on the uh, basically you know how far the carcinoma has spread so if the esophageal adenocarcinoma is limited to the mucosa and submucosa the five year survival is very good around 80% but in advanced stages where they have involved the cirrhosis or any lymph node metastasis it drops down to 25% only so with this we have completed about the esophageal adenocarcinoma anyone is having any doubt with regards to esophageal adenocarcinoma yes anyone is having any doubt okay i think this is simple enough so now we are going to see the more common variety of esophageal adenocarcinoma that is your squamous cell carcinoma very 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 important now there are multiple risk factors for development of squamous cell carcinoma and this all these risk factors becomes very important from the exam point of view so all the mcqs okay all the aims pattern exams mle pattern exams okay all of them they have mcq from this portion so usually squamous cell carcinoma is involving adults more than 45 years of age in males the risk of development is four times again the males are predisposed for development alcohol and tobacco can predispose to the development of squamous cell carcinoma so does poverty caustic esophageal injury aplasia cardia tylosis and plummer vinson syndrome so these are syndrome plummer vinson syndrome we have read uh, basically in case of iron deficiency anemia where there was esophageal web formation along with uh, beefy tongue atrophic glossitis along with we used to have esophageal webs and iron deficiency anemia so all these things together they were giving rise to plummer vinson syndrome and then there is something called as a tylosis syndrome which is characterized by hyperkeratosis in the palms and soles okay frequent intake of hot beverages deficient diet a uh, deficient in fruits and vegetables there is an eight fold increased risk of squamous cell carcinoma in african americans the intake of polycyclic hydrocarbons and nitrosamines which are very much predominant in packaged food sometimes the packaged food they become bad they become fungus contaminated which can increase the risk of development of squamous cell carcinoma also human papilloma virus infection uh, they predispose to the development of oral or you know esophageal squamous cell carcinoma coming to the genetics loss of function mutation of certain tumor suppressor gene like the t p53 e cadherin and notch 1 it predisposes to the development of squamous cell carcinomas similarly amplification of sox2 gene or cyclin d1 they are also involved in the causation of squamous cell carcinoma now there is a place in western kenya there is a small group of individuals less than 30 years of age okay now over there these individuals have a very high risk of development of esophageal squamous cell carcinoma why because they are consuming a traditional fermented milk called as mursik okay and this traditionally fermented milk is containing acetaldehyde which is increasing the risk of development of esophageal carcinoma uh, uh, squamous cell carcinoma so these factors are very very important to understand and remember lot of mcqs comes from this particular part 
So morphologically, as I told you, more than fifty percent of the squamous cell carcinoma is involving the upper one third of the esophagus. Okay, so near nearby areas you can see squamous dysplasia. Okay, that is an in situ lesion. So early lesions are basically grayish white or they are plaque like thickening. So after months to years, they can have different patterns. Okay, so the first most common pattern, which is responsible for sixty percent of the cases of squamous cell carcinoma, is a polypoid or an exophytic pattern. The tumor is protruding into and is obstructing the lumen, and it might also lead because of obstruction. It might also lead to pneumonia. It can lead to pneumonia. The second variety is a diffuse infiltrative variety. If we see, which is constituting the fifteen percent, okay, it is involving the esophageal wall. So there is no mass as such; just the wall is thickened. That is diffusely infiltrative variety, or sometimes the wall might show an extensive ulceration. So twenty-five percent of the cases might show ulceration. So these lesions, on the other hand, they cause thickening, rigidity, and luminal narrowing. So microscopically, if you see. Uh, uh, basically, the squamous cell carcinoma is presenting as a moderate to well differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. So, other variants of squamous cell carcinoma might also appear, like the verrucous variety of squamous cell carcinoma, spindle cell carcinoma, and basaloid variety of squamous cell carcinoma. These are other variants which might also be seen. So, very importantly, we are calling it as a squamous cell carcinoma. So, can everyone appreciate all these? What What are these? Yes. Keratin what are these? Calls. these are the keratin pearls which are characteristics of squamous cell carcinoma okay so this is a moderately differentiated squamous cell carcinoma because keratin pearls can be easily appreciated over here okay and the squamous uh, uh, um, the squamous histology is also well appreciated from this diagram okay now very very important question with regards to the esophageal squamous cell carcinoma very very important mcq that is lymph node metastasis okay the lymph node in metastasis in case of squamous cell carcinoma will depend on the tumor location so any squamous cell carcinoma which is present in the upper one third of the esophagus most commonly they are going to metastasize to the cervical group of lymph nodes those arising from the middle third of the esophagus is going to involve the mediastinal paratracheal and tracheobronchial nodes whereas those involving the lower third of the esophagus is going to involve the gastric and the celiac nodes gastric and the celiac nodes okay now if you look at the clinical features of uh, patients they are presenting with difficulty in swallowing that is dysphagia painful swallowing called as odynophagia or completely there might be obstruction so they will give you a history that they have gradually changed their diet from solid to a liquid diet they present with weight loss cachexia iron deficiency anemia why because of uh, bleeding because of bleeding from the ulcerated uh, squamous cell carcinoma okay so any kind of squamous cell carcinoma presenting as an ulcer can bleed they can be hemorrhage and because them it might also lead to perforation leading to sepsis the five year prognosis the five year prognosis over here if you see in case of superficial tumors it is 75% whereas in case lymph node metastasis has already taken place the survival goes less than 20% the survival will go less than 20% now in the barium swallow classically the classical feature in case of the barium swallow is there is a rat tail appearance which is classically seen in case of barium swallow okay so any doubts anyone is having with regards